Father, we thank you for this workers' retreat. We praise your name because you have given us this time apart so we can seek your face. We thank you for the response of your people. We thank you for the love of your children. We thank you because we all know that we are here for a purpose. And we pray that the purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. For our personal lives, for the lives of members of our family, for the lives of people under our care, for the church as a whole, we pray that you will pour your blessings upon us in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that it will be a time of revival. It will be a time of renewal. It will be a time of power from above in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that everything that will hinder, every spirit that will hinder, every idea, every thought that will hinder, every hindrance that will come our way, you destroy everything in Jesus' name. We pray that the blood of Jesus will cover us, will cover our spirit, will cover our heart, will cover our mind, so that we'll be sheltered from any oppression in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that our ears will be open, our hearts will be open, our spirit will be open, our faith will look up to you in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that none of us will be disappointed. For those of us who are weak, make us strong. For those of us who are discouraged, encourage us. For those of us who have not seen the vision of the Lord for some time, inspire us in Jesus' name. For those of us who are losing people in our leadership in the zone, in our leadership in the area, Oh, Father, we pray, all those who have been lost, you will bring back in Jesus' name. For those of us who have not been hearing your voice, for those of us who have not been able to run with patience, for those of us who have not been standing, for those of us who have been weakened, for those of us whose spiritual lives have been destroyed, Father, we are praying, everything that is wrong, you will repair in Jesus' name. These few days that we are here together, we pray that the showers from heaven will fall upon us. We pray that your dynamite, your explosive power, will arrest every one of us in Jesus' name. Those who have come here to this workers' retreat with sickness, take away the sicknesses. Those who have come with oppression, take away the oppression. Those who have come with discouragement, take away the discouragement. Those who have come with poverty, take away the poverty. Those who have any problem weighing them down. Those who have anything that is not making them to arise and do your work, take it away in Jesus' name. We pray that your spirit will be poured down. Your power will come down. Your knowledge will come down. The anointing will come down. The authority will flow in our hearts that, Lord, all through on this ground, as we pray, as we sing, as we listen, as we preach, whatever we are doing, Father, we pray we will see your presence in Jesus' name. Bless your people, O God. Encourage your people, O God. Draw your people nearer to yourself, that all impossibilities will become possible. Where any one of us has fallen, Father, we pray, raise us up in Jesus' name. Do good unto your people. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight, we have a short time. And yet, during this short period, I want to briefly talk to you on setting the stage for latter-day explosion. Setting the stage for latter-day explosion. Anyone whose eyes are opened... Anyone who has been inspired and instructed of the Lord will know that in the last days, we are preparing for the latter day explosion. Explosion of the power of God. Explosion, explosion of the dynamite of the Lord. Explosion of the Spirit's miracle working power. And yet, we need to set the stage. That means we need to make some preparation so that that latter-day explosion will be upon us and will walk through us in the lives of other people. 
this latter day explosion is spoken about in some passages of scripture in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 17 to verse 18. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs on the, in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here Peter the Apostle, on the day of Pentecost, in the midst of an explosive power of God, stood up and he spoke about the intention of God or the fulfillment of the promise of God. And he said, this is that long-awaited explosion. This is that long-awaited renewal and revival that God himself had spoken through Joel and had said it will so happen that in the last days he will pour his spirit upon all flesh. The latter day explosion is connected with the spirit. In the world, there is an explosion of evil power. In the world, there is an explosion, explosion of witchcraft, familiar spirit, of sorcery, of fortune telling, of the powers of darkness. In the world in which we live today, there are many people that are complaining about a new kind of disease, a new kind of suffering, a new kind of oppression, a new kind of affliction, because the devil knows that he has a short time and is bringing his power upon a lot of people. But the joy of the believer is this, that even though the devil knows that his time is short, and that these are the last days, we have the explosive power of God even in the church today. This is exactly what Peter was talking about. And he said, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, the flesh alone cannot experience the latter-day explosion. It is the coming of the Spirit of God upon the flesh. It is that that will bring the latter-day explosion and make that explosion effective in your life and in my life. And then it talks about things that we will see, things that we will sense, things that will partake of, of the latter-day explosion. It talks about your sons, talks about your daughters, talks about your young men, talks about your old men, talks about the servants, and it talks about the handmaidens. For a long time, explosions have been limited to the people that are old, like Charles G. Finney, like Spurgeon, like John Wesley. For a long time, explosions, spiritual explosions, have not been among young people, among the sons, among the daughters, but in the plan of God. He has so planned that the latter day explosions will affect the sons and the daughters, the young men and the old men. Can you see the growth in this? Sons and daughters, very young. And then young men, older than the sons and daughters, and then the old men. Which means that as we're here, if you really have a mind of partaking in the latter day explosion, you will discover that no matter how young you are, just a child among the sons and daughters, or a young man, a young woman, the growing ones, or the, the servants and the handmaidens, or the old men, old men and women, 
the Lord has so planned that there will be a latter day explosion. When this spiritual explosion comes, number one, it will affect your personal life. How will it affect your personal life? Every blockade that has been in your life, the explosion will blow it out of the way. The explosive authority of the Spirit of God that comes in your life will shatter and will scatter every blockage to progress. I want you to look at your life and examine your life for a moment. You're always reaching out with your hand, but it appears that your hand is not catching what you are reaching out to. It looks as if there is a barrier, there is a blockage, there is a hindrance. It looks as if there is a wall or partition between you and the thing you are reaching out to. The reason we are here for this retreat is that by the grace of God, that latter day explosion will begin to take place in your life. And it will shatter and scatter everything that has been a hindrance to your progress. It will, if you look at your life, sometimes we hear the word of God. And you want your heart to melt, it doesn't melt. You want your heart to tremble, it doesn't tremble. It appears there is a, a dryness and a hardness within your heart. You hear so much and you say, if I could have acted on everything I have heard, I would have been better than days. I would have grown higher than days. The explosion we're talking about tonight will act like a dynamite, like a hammer. And it will blow the hardness and shatter everything to pieces in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes it appears like evil powers are like a thick cloud of darkness above the believer. He tries to pray like Daniel tried to pray. And believers sometimes will find it difficult and hard to penetrate the cloud of darkness above. We pray, but we are not penetrating. We search, but we are not penetrating. We try to do everything we know what to, to do, yet we are not penetrating. What the explosive power of God will do. In the latter day reign that God pours upon his people, that it penetrates into the thick cloud of darkness of spirits, dark spirits. So that all the evil spirits and evil powers forming a great cloud above, everything will be totally scattered and they will be dispelled. Or sometimes it is that you find that hearts are closed to you. Not only in evangelism, maybe in evangelism you are trying to witness and yet you find that the hearts of the people are closed. You cannot get through into them. You do not have an inroad into them. Or sometimes it is like in the office, the minds of the boss or the minds of people around you, they are closed towards you. You write a petition, nobody answers. You make a plea, nobody answers. You tell them, am I not due for promotion? Nobody answers. You tell them, what have I done wrong in this place of work? Other people are passing by and they are making progress. What have I done? They do not answer. What the explosive power of the latter day outpouring of the Spirit of God will do is that it will be an unrestrained inroad to closed doors. It will make you to be able to get in whatever the closed doors are. Closed doors of some places, in the places of work, or the heart. You will have unrestrained inroad. When the explosive power of God begins to work in your life, or you might have found that sin has been tormenting you, tempting you, and overcoming you. What the explosive power of God will do is that we believe it will give you the victory this weekend. Or it may be self that you know that you should have made progress. The only thing that is hindering you, you're too conscious of self. And that consciousness of self is affecting your marriage. It's affecting your friendship. It's affecting brothers and sisters. They say he's always thinking about himself. He's, he's filled with self. He's conscious of self. And he's driving away people from you. You will have victory over self. And it may be Satan or his spirit tormenting you or troubling you. You will have the victory when the explosive power of God comes upon you. 
if you want to have an unforgettable, unforgettable ministry, in days, your generation, what you need is the latter-day explosion of the power of God. Moses added, every door that was closed opened before him. Joshua added, every closed door became open before him. Daniel added, in a regime or in a government of magicians, of sorcerers, of Babylon, of the Middle Persians, the Lord gave him a breakthrough. And that is why we're here this weekend. The Lord will give us a breakthrough. But then, before we can have this latter-day explosion, we need to set the stage. We need to make some preparation. Already I've quoted to you the words of Joel. If you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 16, it says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel spoke about the latter-day explosion, the latter-day outpouring of the Spirit of God. But again, Joel also spoke about the preparation we need to make, the necessity of setting the stage so that we will be able to experience the power of God in our lives. Let's look at Joel and see how to prepare, how to set the stage. Joel from chapter 1, verse 13 and verse 14. Guard yourselves and lament, ye priests, how ye ministers of the altar come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. Here Joel called upon the people. He was telling them on how they will set the stage for the latter day explosion of the power of God upon their lives. He was telling them how they will prepare for the incoming of the Spirit of God upon themselves. He said, guard yourselves. You'll need to do that. Because you see, our minds may be running back to our homes. Our mind may be thinking, I ought to do something at home. Maybe I forgot something at home. It says, guard yourself, put on your belt and get ready for spiritual warfare because the devil will contend every inch of the way. He knows if you have a breakthrough, it will demolish the kingdom of darkness. Because of that, he will be bringing thoughts into your mind while we are here. You need to rise up. You need to go to the toilet. You need to go and drink water. You need to eat now. You need to go outside the gate to buy something. You need bread now. You need um, maybe Fanta now. You need some minerals now. Why? If you don't get up now, all some will kill you. You see, the devil will bring a lot of things. Guard yourselves and say, this is my time. If like Esther, if I die, if I perish, I perish. This one, I will have a breakthrough and you will have a breakthrough. Then it says, lament, ye priests. If you are contented and satisfied, you will never lament. If you are satisfied with your spiritual life, you will never lament. If you do not look at your life and say, why am I not making progress? Why am I not winning more converts? Why am I not having more answers to my prayer? Why am I not overcoming every assault of the enemy, every assault of the devil? And then you begin to see your weakness, you begin to see your shortcoming, you begin to see your uh, powerlessness, you begin to see all the inadequacies in your life, and you begin to lament. If you do not lament, if you do not get sorrowful because of the shortcomings and the weaknesses and the powerlessness and the prayerlessness in your life, you will not be able to have the breakthrough. This is how we set the stage. You gird yourself. You put on your belt. You make sure that there is no flabby thought. There is no uh, a strange thought. There is nothing that will make you to get out of the place of preaching and prayer. And then you begin to lament. You begin to look your life over. And you begin to see, I see my failure in that area. I've not won enough converts. Do I have any convert for this year? The people that are under my care, they are not on fire. I'm not on fire myself. You are not saying that to co condemn yourself. You are not saying that to destroy yourself. You are not saying that to say that you are not a child of God. You are saying that so that you can partake in the latter day explosion. You begin to see areas where you have not done enough. 
areas where you have not got enough victory, areas where you have not got enough achievement, areas where you have not done the work of God successfully. And then he says, How, ye ministers of the altar? That means cry aloud. That means shout. That means let not your prayer be the prayer that is quiet and silent and a prayer that was sleeping over. How? Be very sorrowful about it. You see, there are some people that have never cried in their Christian lives. There are people that have never sobbed. They have never wept. They have never howled. They have never lamented in their Christian lives. You see, there are some people, happy, happy Christians. They will never have explosion or power in their lives. They are never sorrowful. They, are, they have never lamented. They are never sober about the deformities the, the and the inadequacies and the shortcomings and the weaknesses in their lives. Look at verse 14. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Do you know there are people that never take part in prayer meeting for revival? For restoration, for the outpouring of the Spirit of God, for, for revival and the conversion of souls, for transformation of people, the only thing maybe they are fasted about is that they want to be healed. The only thing they are fasted about is maybe they want to get a new job. But Joel was talking about preparation or setting the stage for latter day outpouring of the Spirit of God. And if you are really going to be able to have the outpouring of the Spirit of God upon you, there will be times of fasting. And I'm telling you, if in a zone, we'll gather people together to really pray, to really fast, to look up to the Lord, to break the powers of darkness in the zone, to break the powers of darkness in the community. Sanctify ye a fast, which means set apart a fast. Call a solemn assembly, not a merry assembly, not a jovial assembly, not a dancing assembly, a solemn assembly. Assembly where we all come to think about our stagnant growth, our stunted growth, our failure, our lack of success, our lack of winning souls to the Lord. Where we think about the fact of just being stagnant and not making progress, we sanctify it first, we call a solemn assembly, we gather the elders. All the elders, all the leaders, and the leaders of the church, they count it very important. And you see, there are many people that do not know it is very necessary that leaders in the church, the pastor, the coordinators, the zonal leaders, the women representatives, all the area leaders, all the house fellowship leaders, all the leaders and all the workers. Because you see, the people are looking up to us. If rain does not fall, it's because of our, it's our fault. If the Spirit of God is not poured down, it's our fault. If people are sick of a long time sickness and they are not healed, it's our fault. If people are being demon oppressed and demon possessed and they are not delivered, it's our fault. If people are barren and they are not having children, it's our fault. If people are not having jo jobs in their places, uh, in their communities, it's our fault. If people are not getting converted in dramatic, spectacular manners, it is our fault. And if we don't lament about it, if we're not sorrowful about it, if we're not unhappy about it, if we do not pray with a burden about it, nothing will happen. If the people do not get to the land of Canaan, the land of promise, it is our fault. And their blood will be required at our hand. That's where the elders will gather together with all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. You see, the reason we have come here, it is to be able to bring a latter day explosion of God's power upon deeper life at the headquarters here. And whatever happens at the headquarters church here will affect every state in Nigeria. And it will affect every um, country in Africa as well. That's why it is very, very important for us to make use of this time and really prepare and set the stage for the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Look at chapter 2 from verse 12. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, with fasting, with fasting, and with weeping. 
and with mourning. We must mourn as if people have died. You see, when people are leaving the church, when believers are backsliding, when sinners refuse to be converted in the house fellowship, in the area, in the zone, in the districts, in the city at large, in the suburb, in the village, people are dying spiritually. They are backsliding, they are dying. They refuse to be converted, they are dead. And we ought to mourn for the people that have died spiritually. And those already dying spiritually. And those who are dead and have not been awakened spiritually, we turn to the Lord with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. This is preparation, setting the stage for the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And then it says, rend your heart and not your garments. Rend your heart and not your garments. How do we rent the heart? Well, the way we rent the garment. If you are going to rent a garment, that is if you are going to tear a particular piece of, piece of cloth, first of all, you lay hands on that cloth. You look at that cloth. You pull that cloth apart. You tear that cloth with all your strength. If you are going to rent your heart, what do you do? You focus attention, the searchlight of the word of God on your heart. You do not think about any other thing. You think about your coldness. You think about your sluggishness. You think about your prayerlessness. You think about your weakness. You think about your lack of progress. Think about the time you have become a Christian. Think of how many years you have spent in the Christian fold. Think how weak you still are. Think how your messages are not powerful enough to bring souls into the kingdom of God. Think about your knowledge of scripture. How it appears that you are not understanding too much of the word of God. And then be unhappy with yourself. Rend your heart and not your garment. Turn unto the Lord your God. Face the Lord. Look at the Lord. And then be on your knees before the Lord and say, Lord, like Jacob, if you do not bless me and pour this great spirit of God upon me, I will not let you go. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. It is when we do this that we are preparing for the latter day explosion. And then in verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. It re it's repeated again. You see our meeting together here is so that this assembly will be solemn. And instead of talking about our victory, instead of talking about how many people we want to the Lord, because if we're all the time talking about all that we want to the Lord, what we have been doing, what great sacrifices we had, how we have done so much in the zone and in the district, we'll be contented, we'll be satisfied, we'll never be in a solemn assembly, we'll be jubilating, we'll be celebrating. But then it says, we have not seen the explosive yet, explosive power of God. If you want to see that explosive power of God, you will have to come to a solemn assembly. If husband and wife are always laughing together, always talking together, always smiling together, always saying, well, we praise God since we came to this deeper life. We won uh, one person to the Lord last year. This year we won a family to the Lord. If we are happy with what we are doing, we'll never lament. It will never be a solemn assembly. Then it says in verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. That's what I was talking about when I was talking about life in the camp. That even those of us who are in courtship now, or those who have just got married a few months ago, a few weeks ago, this is not the time for honeymoon. This is the time for a solemn assembly. Verse 17. Let the priest and the ministers of God weep between the porch and the altar. Let me point out this. And you know, uh, I'm not saying this to make anybody feel condemned. What I discover is that some of our leaders, they pray so quietly. They pray in a dignified manner. They do not pray with real concern, with real body, with tears, with real weeping. If we're going to have a revival, we must really pray agonizing prayer. You need to read about Moses praying 
about Elijah praying. You need to read about those apostles of old praying. You need to see Paul the apostle praying. And if you have uh, not uh, known about them, you need to see how Finney prayed. How sometimes he'll go into the woods. A real evangelist, a real great preacher, and an educated preacher for that matter. He was a lawyer. Before he came to the Lord, you need to see him pray. He really prayed and cried. You need to see Father Nash, who was uh, a companion with um, Charles G. Finney. You need to see him pray. You need to see John Wesley when he prayed. About 1735 through uh, to 1770, uh, the way that man prayed with real agony, with real crying, with real tears. No wonder revival came in their own time. And you need to see how David Brennard prayed. Those were people that really brought down revival and E.M. Bounds. He, in fact, it appeared that the life of E.M. Bounds is concentrated on praying and praying alone. Of all the books he wrote, I don't know how many books he wrote, but the seven that remain that we see today is mainly on prayer and revival. I'm talking about E.M. Bounds. Those people, they really prayed. And if you have read the book, Why Revival Tarries? Revival Tarries because a lot of us who are leaders in the congregation, we are not praying. The kind of prayer, you ask yourself, the kind of prayer you pray, can it defeat the devil? The kind of prayer you pray, will the devil take note of it? The kind of prayer you pray, will it rend the heavens open? The kind of prayer that you pray, will it make the demons to flee away? The kind of prayers you pray, will it soar into heaven and shatter the hardness of heart of the unbelievers? And it says in this verse 17, let the priests... And the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? With many of us in our various localities, unbelievers are beginning to say, Where is your God? And you know why? Because we are not praying. The kind of prayer we pray does not move heaven, does not shake hell, does not scatter the enemy, does not cast out the evil spirit. The kind of prayer we pray does not even affect headache, does not even affect stomach trouble, does not even affect ordinary smoking habits that people have. The kind of prayers we pray does not deliver people in a violent manner out of the hands of the devil. If we will start that kind of prayer, start that kind of prayer, I believe that the people will not be able to say again, where is our God? After this retreat, they will stop saying, where is our God? Amen. They will know our God is alive. And it is after this kind of preparation, after the lamenting, after the weeping, after the crying unto the Lord, after the calling of the solemn assembly, after really bombarding heaven, and telling God, we do not want to remain as we have been. We don't want the church to remain as the church has been. That the church must have revival. The church must have transformation. The church must have renewal. All the hard-hearted people that have been coming to the church from this weekend, the hardness of their heart must be broken down. All the backsliders that have been coming to the church and they refuse to be born again, after this weekend, they must be blown into the kingdom of God. All the oppression that have been up upon people, after this weekend, all the oppression will be shattered and scattered. All those evil spirits and evil powers, everything must get away in Jesus' name. It is not in our church that doctors will be telling people that they are incurable. All incurable diseases in our church, on, on members in our church, on our workers, after this weekend, there will be no incurable disease again. It is not in our church that will be hearing that this case is impossible. There is no solution to this. There is no solution to that. Our God is still on the throne. It is because we are not preparing, we are not setting the stage for latter day explosion. But from tonight, we are going to begin to set the stage. If you really are expecting rain, you'll bring your empty buckets out. If you are expecting rain, if you are going to go out, you'll go with an umbrella. If you are expecting the explosive power of God, you will do something about it. It is after all this had been done that God himself says 
that it will pour his spirit upon us. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward. After you have set the stage, after you have made the preparation, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, fire and pillars of smoke. In verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That means after the explosive power of God has come, prayer will become easy. Whosoever will, come, will call upon the Lord in the house fellowship, in the area, people will be getting saved every time. You know now, it's unfortunate in our church that for a whole month, for two months, for three months, some zones do not have any baptismal candidate. They cannot present anybody for water baptism. Zonal leader, house leader, area leader, and all the women representatives in that single zone, they cannot come together and bind all the paths of darkness and get people saved. That one month, two months, three months, we don't have any convert to be baptized in water. But now, after this weekend, I believe it shall come to pass. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Newcomers, as they come to the church on Monday, they get born again. As they come on Thursday, they get born again. As they come on Sunday, they get born again. As they go to the house fellowship, the Spirit of God will convict them seriously on their sins. And they will be saying, what shall I do to be born again? What shall I do to be saved? If we get prepared and get ready for the explosion of the power of God, I believe it will come. Let's rise up. And tonight, let us begin to set the stage. Tonight, let us begin to pray. Tonight, let us begin to tell the Lord, that we're not going to allow this weekend of workers' retreat to pass us by. Revival must come. Revival must come. The explosive power of God must come upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh God of revival, the God that has chosen Nigeria to be a place where the gospel will be beamed into various parts of the world. The Lord that has chosen us in this generation to stand between the gap so that sinners will be saved. We adore you. We bless you. We glorify you. We thank you, Lord, because you have unfolded to us the secret by which revival, real meaningful, lasting revival will come down among us. Father, we are very sorry for how we have not set the real stage for revival. Father, we are praying that right from now on, the spirit of prayer will be manifested in us in Jesus' name. That everywhere and anywhere, in our homes, in our areas, in our house fellowships, in our districts, even in the central church. Father, we pray, O oh God, that the spirit of prayer will prevail in Jesus' name. Father, we are asking that as we are gathered here, O oh God, over these few days, even to gather at your feet and listen to messages and be revived. Father, we pray that the spirit of prayer will prevail among us in Jesus' name. That in the dormitory, we will pray. In the hostel, we will pray. Everywhere, we will pray. In the kitchen, we will pray. In the toilet, we will pray. Right in the uh, auditorium here, we will pray in Jesus' name. Father, and we are asking that as we go out praying, that Lord, hell, the powers of hell, will be shattered in the name of Jesus Christ. The shackles of oppression will be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. That, Lord, all captivities of the devil, all oppressions of the devil, whether in individuals or in groups, oh God, will be totally removed in Jesus' name. Mighty and everlasting Father, we need this spirit of prayer. 
we need the burden of prayer. We need the practice of prayer. We need to make prayer as our own habit. Father, you have mentioned people like Charles Finney, people who champion revival in their own dispensation. And whenever they saw that things were growing cold, Charles Finney, Father Nash, we go ahead, crying upon the Lord, praying and fasting and waiting upon the Lord. And what happens? Revival will come down again. Souls will be saved again. And all those who are resisting the gospel will be giving their lives to the Lord in thousands and millions. Father, we are living at an age where because of a lack of prayer that people are resisting the gospel and we are not experiencing real growth in the house fellowship. Father, tonight we bury that type of thing in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you because you have answered. We bless you because you have answered. We glorify you because you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.